There we go. Uh, I'd say, um, yeah, you, you've heard about me, so that's enough. So, yeah, you're going to get a weekend's worth of um, uh, field work and, and training in an hour, hopefully. So um, hold on to your hats and I apologise if it's a, a bit of a mad race through. But, um, yeah, we haven't got much option, really, unless you were here all afternoon with me, which would be very lovely, but I'm sure you've got better things to do. Um, so I've got about four various PowerPoints and PDFs, uh, so largely based on the uh, this CD. So that's where we're going to go through. Um, I will look at uh, an introduction to myriapods on CD1, which is sort of general uh, background on the myriapods. Uh, specifically then what are millipedes, um, looking at their taxonomy, morphology, life history, that kind of thing. And then we will uh, look at, there's a simplified key as part of this um, uh, CD, and we'll go through that so that if you come to use it, the terms will be familiar. And it's also just a good way of, of flagging up some of the common, uh, more distinctive species that you might encounter. If we get time, at the end, I've also got a little presentation about some of the new species that are out there. Um, a bit later on, I'll probably mention, well, the, the CD suggests that there are about 60 species of millipede in Britain. When this was written, which is perhaps over just about 10 years or so ago, there were roughly 60 species in Britain. There are now 81 known. Um, so there are a tremendous group to get into. There's so much to be found out. There's so many new species to be seen and, and new discoveries. So, so any, any work that you might do with millipedes is really, really interesting, really useful and contributes uh, lots to, to the recording and uh, conservation of these things. But also just from a pure point of, you know, just the motivation of looking for things where you might find new species to your county or new species to Britain. And as I say, in the last perhaps four years, there are at least, at least two new species to science found in Britain. So uh, if that's not motivation enough, I don't know what is. So um, uh, as I say, I'm going to look through the, uh, this, this CD uh, ROM. Um, it's, it comes in three specific packages. Um, I'll start with the centipedes and myriapods, and then we'll look at the millipedes, but there is also the wood lice. It's 12 quid, get it from naturebureau.co.uk, and uh, uh, it, was, it was provided by a, a grant by Opal, so it should be a lot more expensive than that, but there's over 700 colour photographs, so it's a, it's a pretty old thing, and it's, it's designed, um, we designed it, if you can see me in a tiny little corner of your screen, um, this is sort of the masterwork, this, uh, the Linnaean Society key by Gordon Blower. Um, so that's the technical book with all the sort of genitalia and, and what have you. Um, but there aren't many pretty pictures in that. So it complements that very nicely with, you say, uh, that's, that's 700 photographs of millipedes, centipedes and, um, and wood lice. Um, it covers uh, this, this presentation today and, and the key within, uh, within the uh, CD. Most of the common and distinctive species that you, you're likely to see in Northern Britain, uh, inland Northern Britain. Um, so it's very good. It was rich, written originally as a Yorkshire key and covered everything within Yorkshire. But um, if you live in the south, uh, or if you, and I guess not everybody uh, on this call is necessarily living in the northwest, um, but uh, if, you, if you live on the coast, there may be additional species to look out for. If you live in South Wales, there are certainly some new species to look out for, but again, in the, in the warmer parts of Britain. But otherwise, um, should be pretty good for, for identifying most of the stuff you're likely to find. For further information, as I say, there's the British Myriapod Group um, website, which has got loads of information and uh, recommends various books. Um, just ways, you can, again, you can't see these sort of things, but you know, there are all sorts of atlases, European atlases, British atlases, and uh, a host of things that will help you. If you prefer a hard copy of a book, this CD-ROM, does also print out quite well. Um, so you can end up with it as a, 
as a nice hard copy publication to sit by your microscope as well. So plenty of information, BMIG uh, website will guide you through uh, where to find uh, um, information that you want. It lists all the British species, it's updated regularly, has photographs of most of them. Um, so that's the place uh, to get most of the information. And uh, yeah, so that's the same thing again. It's free to join, as I say, and you'll get a newsletter um, probably by email these days. You can get a hard copy and there is a bulletin produced roughly annually, um, which adds to the, the descriptions of all these British species. So um, what, what my um, presentation and what Blower's book, uh, where, they, where they're limited, you'll find that the BMIG bulletin um, brings up today and they're available for free the, the back issues you, to download and have a look at on on the website so no excuses the resources are out there so um, we just need to get you some terminology uh, and a bit of understanding roughly about where to find these things and you can go out and and record them um, when you do record another really really useful thing these days with a lot of groups are the Facebook groups and uh, there is uh, a Facebook group for these, uh, for the myriapods and isopods, which is excellent. And that's where, right, right as, as it happens, you see the new species appear where people are finding them and you uh, and get help with recognizing new species, but also seeing where the distributions are changing because people are finding them all over the country. If you've got something you need help with, people are always there, very helpful uh, group of people to help you identify things. So. There we go. Um, that should be all you need from that. This is the front page of the CD-ROM, Introduction to Myriapods and Centipedes. Um, I know that centipedes are myriapods, so just, but this, this part of the key uh, describes the myriapods and the centipedes, and then the millipede one had just, just refers to the uh, millipedes without the introduction to myriapods. But because of that, we're going to um, move on through the key. So I'll just whiz past. So why on earth look at myriapods in general? Let's, let's include the centipedes briefly. Um, because of time, I'm not gonna go into this uh, in, in huge detail, but they are ecologically important species. They're, they're very uh, important in all sorts of um, uh, life histories of other animals and, and food chains or whatever. They're available all year round. So you can look at, you can study these, it's not like butterflies where you wait for a bit of sunshine in, in the summer. You can do this all the time. There are relatively few, I say there were, we thought there were 60, but now we've, there are over 80 species to find, but that's quite a, a manageable number. It's not like um, 2000, whatever, you know, um, I don't know how many hoverflies, there are 700 of those or something. So it's a, it's a nice number to get to grips with. And the skills that you learn um, looking at myriapods are very useful, very transferable to other things as well, um, other soil invertebrates in particular, and a lot of terrestrial invertebrates. They are well studied, there are good resources out there. Um, so it, it's, it, there's a lot of help in, in the process. Um, as I say before, there's plenty of new things being found, um, so plenty of scope for you to um, find interesting things and keep your interest and motivation up. The, the recording scheme, BMIG, are very active. Um, as I say, these, there, are, there are atlases. Uh, the new centipede atlas is ooh, very close to coming out, so uh, it's, it's probably months away, just a couple of months away, probably. And so there, there, there are up-to-date um, maps uh, where things are. So again, very useful um, group to be looking at. Um, ecology of soil invertebrates is very economically important. I think that's a, that's a very big growing area these days in ecology and the recognition that everything starts in the soil pretty much. And these creatures are very much soil invertebrates. So lots of reasons. Um, so throughout this, uh, the CDs, there are these pauses. It's, it can be self-taught or it can be taught as I'm doing it today. So you get these moments of pause for thought. I'm not going to ask you all of them, but we might get an opportunity later to actually ask some questions. But we're racing on today because there's no time. So arthropods, they are arthropods. Millipedes are, uh, they have a hard exoskeleton. They have jointed legs. And uh, beyond that, 
I shall say not a lot more, but they, this is their classification. Um, they're actually a really diverse uh, group when we talk about Myriapoda. You can see at the top of that list, you have all of the insects, the Hexapoda up there with springtails, etc. cetera. Um, so everything is packed into that one little corner. You've got um, all of the Chelicerata down there with the, the, uh, the arachnids and there, and even the Crustacea had just one um, thread off at the side. But the Myriapods, very, very diverse, barely related to one another, really. Um, we're not going to be talking about poropods and some phyla today. Um, obviously, the centipedes, the chylopods will get mentioned on and off, but uh, really, we're just, it's just that one branch that we're looking at, the diplopoda. Um, but they are very diverse. I've got, normally, I would wave a book around. I've got a book of Australian um, invertebrates, and on every page, there's an order of, of, of animals, uh, of different invertebrates. And you get like the beetles, the most diverse, you know, order of, of animals in the world, gets one page. There are nine pages on myriapods because there, there's so much difference and variation between them. So when I'm, I'm generalizing later on, and I will apologize because, you know, I'll say, well, generally this is the case, but it isn't always the case because not everything uh, is the same. They are quite diverse things. So we will uh, move on to the next. So even so within the myriapod group, you can see that the centipedes are off over at the side there, some phylums and poropods. And even within the, millip uh, the millipedes, we've got a couple of extra branches. Everything we're looking at today is in those last two, the Pencilata and the Chylonatha. So um, they are just lumped together pretty much. They've been lumped together since um, 1793 or thereabouts um, by Fabricius. And uh, um, they, are, they used to be considered as a, as a crustacean, um, but now they've been separated out largely because they have a lot of legs. So they, are, they have myriad pods, myriad legs, lots of legs. Um, they are entirely terrestrial um, and breathe through just tracheal systems. So basically they've got a hole in the side and air um, is one way or another um, spread around the body. So there's nothing too complicated about the, uh, the, their breathing and respiration. Um, it's not divided into thorax, abdomen. Um, it's just really several multiplied uh, similar leg bearing segments. Um, they'll have anything between six when they are newly hatched individuals, so a, a, essentially an insect um, when it's born, um, uh, up to 750. So if you're anywhere near San Francisco uh, and some of the foggy forests up there, there is a species called Elacme clenipes, which I think is the most leggy creature on earth at 750 legs. So um, that's the millipede claim to fame. We will not mention the poropods of the symphyla today. So as I say, diplopoda is the name for millipedes. Uh, diplopoda roughly meaning pairs of legs. So they have uh, two pairs of legs per body segment, um, unlike the centipedes, which have one pair of legs per body segment. And um, occasionally that's untrue in that some of the leg pairs are modified for some other function, usually uh, to form genitalia. So um, there might be a pair of legs missing because they've uh, formed in some, type, some kind of structure for transferring sperm or something like that. So, but generally speaking, two pairs of legs per body segment. They're also, um, they're detritivores. They feed on dead vegetation and detritus. And so they have very robust uh, chewing mouth parts rather than uh, bitey uh, poisonous ones like you see in the centipedes. There are a variety of uh, different orders, um, so as I say that's why that book, that Australian book, has a number of different uh, uh, perspectives on, 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 on millipedes alone because you've got a, a whole, there, there are additional orders in Australia to these as well. Um, so We'll look at these in, in more detail, but you can see there's quite a, a diversity in form and function um, as, as you look at different types of millipedes, so um, very hard to generalise. 
but uh, that um, the way that the uh, uh, the way that these things are uh, divided is, um, uh, or the, the the orders are uh, separated out, is is based on the degree of fusion between the sort of top, middle, and chest part of those body rings. So if you imagine that you've got, uh, if you cut these across and cross section, your, your millipede, um, looking at the one at the bottom, glomeris there, um, glomeris is a, is a species which curls up into a ball, so it needs to be quite flexible so it can curl into a ball. So the tergites, uh, which are the, the sort of back plates, and the sternites, which you know, is its sternum, the central uh, underlying plates uh, on the belly, if you like, are quite flexible, and the pleurites, the bits in between, are also articulated. So that allows the thing to curl up into a ball. Something like polydesmus, which we'll look at in a moment in more detail, uh, these flat-backed millipedes, they need to be um, they need to be rigid because they're 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 designed for pushing. So in order to be rigid, all of those tergite pleurites and sternites are fused together. So you've got this solid ring around uh, the, the sort of form of the body. And so we, uh, so you see quite a difference. And um, when we look at the, the more detailed taxonomy of these groups uh, of different millipedes, it's based really on the degree of, uh, of that fusion and the articulation between those different zones of, of, the, uh, of the body when, when seen in cross-section. So um, we'll um, think, where are we? We will move on to, because we will be repeating some of that in a moment on the millipede slide. So we're still in the myriapod section, but um, very briefly, I mean, I think, I think this um, event has been billed as uh, a, a course on identification rather than um, uh, much else. So I, I, I want to get on to looking at uh, characters of, of individual species as much as we can. But obviously, if, if you're a beginner, um, I, I, I should apologize Ed, because of the process that we got here. Normally I would go around a room and ask everyone for their level of experience, uh, how much you're familiar with millipedes, um, so that I can pitch things uh, to the audience I've got before me. But um, the audience I've got before me is my computer, I'm afraid, today. Um, so I'll, I'll try and uh, balance a general introduction with a bit more detail where I can and uh, pick me up with questions at the end on anything that I don't cover in sufficient detail. Um, so ecology, generally speaking, as I've said, is um, difficult to generalize even between some of these, uh, the, the myriapods themselves, but most all myriapods can be considered one way or another as a soil dwelling, um, whether they're actually deep into the soil, just in the leaf litter on the surface, or even uh, under bark of trees. Um, <clears throat> they're generally in these damp areas where there is decaying matter um, for, for them to feed upon. Um, so their general requirement is moisture. They, they, despite having a hard exoskeleton, unlike insects, they don't have that waxy uh, protection that, that insects have, which prevents a lot of um, uh, the, the, the loss of moisture. So they like humidity. So generally speaking, not in, not in dry areas, though there are millipedes which are quite good at trotting across footpaths and the like and living in quite dry areas. Generally dry, uh, moist areas, plenty of food stuff, which in this case is leaf litter or, or dead wood um, in, in, in a general sense, any kind of rotting vegetation. Occasionally they will feed on dead animal matter as well. Um, and the centipedes are there too for very similar reasons, except they're feeding on those things that are, feed, that are feeding on those detritus. Um, so um, <clears throat> where are we? Yes. So they're generally out of the way. One or two, as I say, will will walk across um, some something like that black snake millipede there. Um, are quite good at uh, retaining the moisture within the body, um, but it, it's it's quite unusual. 
Reproduction, uh, they lay eggs, so it requires, generally speaking, two, two adults, though some of them are parthenogenetic and can reproduce uh, basically on their own, um, well, with their, with their uh, similar, usually females um, that can reproduce together. Um, but pathogenic species don't necessarily have to have both sexes present. Um, they'll lay eggs. Um, these eggs will hatch um, into these uh, initially a little pupoid like thing without any legs and six legs. Then they'll increase quite rapidly um, by shedding their skin and adding another pair of legs at, at, the, at the back end, usually until they reach maturity uh, and, and then they can reproduce. Um, as we'll probably see later, I think it crops up later, almost uniquely, I'm not quite sure how unique this is, but very unusually, um, millipedes, some species reach maturity, then they'll shed their skin into become a non-mature form. So they can reproduce, then they'll become a form that can't reproduce, and then they can shed their skin again to become a reproductively active uh, uh, individual again. So it's and that's quite unusual that something reaches kind of sexual maturity and then loses that ability to reproduce, um, which is which is quite unusual and very intriguing. The um, the majority of myriapods are in the tropics, um, but um, you know there, there there are plenty in in Britain, but slightly more in the south of the country. Um, and generally speaking, around in in, in Britain because of their their, their ability. Oh, their inability to cope with dry weather. Um, you tend to see more in the autumn and winter months, really summer is not the best time, but they are available all year round, uh, as I said before. Um, the best areas are also those that are high in calcium because they've got this exoskeleton that requires um, calcium to, to, to build that, um, a nice limestone or, or a, a chalky area uh, are, are the richest in, in diversity for, for millipedes. But sand, sandy areas are very good. Um, at a microscopic level, a lot of those sand grains are limestone. Um, so they're not, it's not just silica. So uh, it, sandy areas can also be equally good. And um, urban areas, that, that delightful shot on the left-hand side of a particularly pretty bit of Sheffield, um, Old bricks, rubbish, um, landfill and uh, roadside tipping uh, does tend to be quite productive for, for millipedes. Um, the mortar in bricks and uh, cement and, and, and concrete and what have you, uh, it has that artificial uh, raised calcium, uh, so a much more alkaline environment than you might expect in it's certainly somewhere in Sheffield, which is very acidic uh, geology normally. Um, so it has to be said, I quite like a bit of um, uh, tipping and, and rubbish if I'm looking for millipedes, because it, it artificially transfers species around uh, for you to find. Gardens are very good because they're, they're very artificial in their geology and, the, and their planting. So uh, gardens tend to be a tremendous um, uh, source of, of different species of millipede as well as don't just have to look in rubbish tips. You'll be pleased to hear. Uh, when it comes to searching, the easiest thing is get down on your hands and knees and 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 have a look. Uh, break off, open bits of dead wood, lift bark, rummage through leaf litter, turning over embedded stones. These are the techniques that you need. Um, I would wave, uh, I, I use um, different uh, trowels for digging. I always make sure there's some bright colour on it because we all leave our trowels behind when we're looking for um, myriapods and millipedes as, as any of you've done it before. It's very easy to lose these things so something that's brightly coloured works a treat. Um, but anywhere where there is a damp uh, area, uh, soil, embedded rocks, particularly good leaf litter, as I say. So, so you're looking for that combination of food and habitat and moisture. And, and that's the that sort of place you're going to start finding these creatures. So again, there we go. Um, an embedded stone <coughs> in the ground is, um, 
it's often considered people say, oh yes, millipedes or wood lice, whatever, they live under stones. They don't really live under stones particularly. It's just as, a, as someone looking for them, that's a really good place to look. Um, these things are dispersed right through the soil, undoubtedly, um, and you will find them in all sorts of places. But underneath a log and underneath a rock, A, if you're a creature that's working its way up from the soil and you hit a hard surface, then that's the place that they'll stop because they can go no further. So that's a good place to find them. Um, also, it may be that you've got a piece of uh, brick, as, as in that image, so you've got that increased area, um, sort of a concentration of calcium in that area, perhaps. Um, so it's more alkaline than perhaps the surrounding soil might be. So that's an attractant. And also, if you've got uh, hot rock in warm soil, warm uh, cold soil with warm rock, whichever, uh, however it works out, that uh, there's a condensation point as well um, where the rock meets the, the soil. Um, so that's increasing the humidity as well. So it's often a very good place to find things. I went searching some years ago. It was minus nine. I was in a quarry um, and I had to get a crowbar to get um, limestone boulders out of, the, out of the frozen soil. And uh, even under there, they're fine. It's, they were like running around. There were millipedes, wood lice. They, were, they didn't know it was cold. Um, I was freezing. But um, you know, down into that soil, there's a, there's a real consistency, um, which uh, really benefits a lot of these creatures. So um, obviously the same applies if it's, a, if it's a, a log, then they've got a food supply that they're banging into as well, which is uh, ideal and some dead wood for them to feed on. And so for collecting purposes, so you're looking out there, you're picking things up by hand, uh, say I did with uh, uh, just any garden trowel, uh, little stalks, bill, soft, um, delicate uh, forceps are very useful, uh, pen knives for um, lifting bark or digging a little bit, uh, a hand lens of one sort or another, um, whatever, you, times 10 should be a minimum. This one's got a times 15 uh, just for because my eyesight requires a, a little bit of zoning in. Um, and a, a times 10 hand lens is probably sufficient. But in the field, you can identify quite a lot of species if you've got a hand lens with you. Um, it's a cling film can be useful, you know, keep that from your sandwiches because it just helps you to hold a specimen still to examine it, turn it upside down. And that, again, is one of these techniques which applies to a lot of different invertebrates. So if you've got a uh, carry a little piece of cling film with you, um, I'm sure we don't approve of cling film anymore um, ecologically, but nonetheless, if you've got some, um, you can fold it around your specimen and it gives you that ability to inspect it from all sides. Um, I'm not going to go into too much more detail about that. We haven't really got time. If we'd been out in the field, we'd have been able to look at this in detail. Um, in terms of picking things up, possibly a paintbrush just to wet a paintbrush and some of the very tiny things, it's a nice delicate way, but equally you've got four fingers and, and a thumb on each hand, which I wouldn't recommend you use the same finger each time that you stick it into the dirt. But um, that's all I do. Um, and they are quite robust. When, when you're used to handling millipedes, you realize that apart from some of the very tiny uh, ones, they, they, they can take um, being handled quite well. And here, if you can see me on this screen, real millipedes, folks, actual millipedes. That's as close as we're going to get today. But um, there we are, some millipedes in here, which I prepared earlier. But look, you can just pick them up. They're just, they're very easy things to just pick up. They're not, they're very robust creatures. They might wriggle around, they might disagree with what you're doing. But look, that's it. This, there's a day school for you. That's all you saw. That's the real millipede. Wow. Um, Carulia cinctus for those. Cylindriulus Carulia cinctus. Um, but they are fairly straightforward things to, to handle. So don't be afraid to pick one up. Um, let's just go on. Okay. Um, 
sieving that you can use other techniques such as you know how to how to actually find the things in the soil and the leaf litter um you don't need expensive sieves like this um i use uh sieves that are used for um refining the soil for bonsai trees and so you get a, quite a big garden sieve with three different gauges of sieve within it and I, I select the one uh, usually that I want to use and, and sieve into a white tray. If you've got a white tray that's half black and half white, even better, because some of the white things show up better against a dark background and vice versa. Um, but just sieving into a tray, sieving leaf litter, that's a really good way to save you searching um, forever for things through leaf litter and, and narrows it down a little bit and not going into too much detail about how to set up pitfall traps but again you can establish little traps in the ground millipedes as with harvestmen and centipedes and woodlice and all sorts of things will fall into that and you can then come back uh, the next morning and see what you've collected um, another um, less active way of doing things is uh, you grab your bag of leaf litter while you're in the field take it back to your lab create a, a funnel system, put a light above it, and because they don't want to be dry and the light source is, is warm and the light source also tends to indicate the sun, so they'll move away from the sun, they'll move away from the dryness, they'll work their way to the bottom of the funnel and they'll fall out into a tube at the bottom. So um, very easy to create a Tolgren uh, or Burley's funnel system just by buying um, a large funnel from b and or Garden Centre and, uh, and setting that system. It helps if you've got a bit of um, mesh in between to keep the leaf litter above uh, and then the species will drop through. But that, you, that can take uh, two, three, four days for everything to fall through, but you'll get everything that was in there running away. Don't, don't heat them up too quickly, otherwise they die before they get to run away. Um, so all sorts of ways of finding things. Um, if you need to look at the specimens, you, well, you will need to look at many specimens require genitalia uh, examination and some very small characters. Um, it, it's, it takes a while before you can identify a lot of these things in the field, unfortunately. Um, so a decent microscope helps um, and you'll need to take specimens. If you collect specimens, we usually just drop them straight into 70 to 80%, 80 percent um, IMS or bioethanol, which you can buy from uh, B&Q fairly cheaply. Um, drop them into a bottle that both that kills them straight away and preserves them. Uh, there's none of this messing about that you get with insects where you've got to catch it, you've got to kill it, you've then got to perhaps um, pin it and relax it and wait for it to dry and then transfer it to a box and put a label on. The job's done with a millipede, it goes into a pot of alcohol and it stays in that pot of alcohol. Drop in there a label which will tell you where you found it, um, a grid reference of where you found it, the date and who found it. That's, that's the bare minimum um, to, to make that a valuable scientific specimen and that should last as long as it's not drying out that that will last for many many years and uh, people can then refer back to it if there's a problem or if species change somewhere along the line. So I'm now going to see if we can close that down and Hopefully you can all see an introduction to millipedes at this point. Good, I see nods, good, thank you. Um, so this is the next CD um, in, the, in the series and is entirely uh, about millipedes. Now, and I'm just going to rattle through the introduction again. And there's just a picture there, you can quite clearly see, clearly see the two pairs of leg, legs per body segment. Um, so that's the distinctive character. Uh, you've seen this before. Right. Um, the British fauna, as I say now, is there's now around 81 species, I think. Um, probably about 35 of those you'll find uh, in inland locations. Quite a lot of those new species have been found in heated greenhouses. So they're a bit of a cheat in some respects, but um, some, some lovely creatures that, that 
that one on the bottom right is one of my favorite tiny little thing, very furry. Um, and it's, it's called Hesutus because it's quite hairy. Um, the lovely little beast, which is only in about three heated greenhouses in the country, but wasn't known. I, don't, I think that's the species that wasn't known from the wild for quite a long time, but was known from Kew and Rotherham. Um, but I think it's now in northern Queensland, but I'm, I'm open to be corrected. Right, so the six orders I mentioned that we uh, are represented outdoors in, in Britain can be seen there. That's a general um, for uh, idea of the forms. That central picture, you can see that one of the smallest British millipedes curled up on the back of one of the, well, the largest British millipede there. And so very varied in their forms. They are primarily designed for pushing, um, so they're, they're built for power. Two pairs of legs gives them power. They're not built for speed. Centipedes are fast. Um, these are powerful. Um, primarily, they have this, this shield just behind the head called a column, which is it's like the, the front of a bulldozer, and that's, that's pushing its way through uh, whatever substrate it finds itself in. Um, and, and you'll see that in a lot of them and, and the position and that's quite helpful for us. So the general forms, we have four probably main types of millipede in this country that you might recognise. There's one bristly millipede. The bristly millipede is covered with these little uh, trichomes, as they're called, um, which are just, um, as you say, bristly. Um, it's got a sort of like feathery appearance. There are the pill millipedes, which curl into a ball. And then there are snake millipedes, which are cylindrical in form. And then the flatbacks, which, as you can see from that bottom right picture, um, have a very much flattened surface on the, on the top and these sort of wings sticking out at the side. Um, so there we are. There they are again in detail, those, those four particular forms. Um, the bristly millipede. Um, with these hollow serrated bristles. And then the snake millipedes tend to be able to curl into a uh, spiral of one sort or another. And then the pill millipedes, of which there are a few, uh, is a much tighter, slightly off circular um, um, form of ball that they, they create. And then the flatbacks, which have these paranota, as they're called, like these wings that flatten out at the side. Now, I'm looking at the time, and at this point, oh, I'll give you one more before I move on. Um, there's also this species, which you will only see in the bottom southeast corner of England. Um, this is a fantastic creature, quite large, brightly coloured, called Polyzonium germanicum. And um, these days we're tending to call these the Womble millipedes. If you can see the sort of pointed face of that one on the right with, with a few eyes, they're quite Womble-like in their appearance. Um, they have a sucking tubular sort of mouth parts so uh, and um, there, there are a couple of types that we found in Britain now. Um, but they're, they're very rare, but if you see one you probably know it when you see it because it's such an unusual thing, but only if you're living Kent or uh, Sussex, I think it is. Um, these were those forms we mentioned earlier. And again, I'm not going to major on this. It's, it's in the CD and we haven't got time, quite frankly, today to go into the difference between these different uh, uh, sub-zonations, if you like, within, within the, the families. But um, it's worth saying again that they, these, these are divided largely into how flexible the creature is. And you'll see, um, you'll see the flexibility differences when you ha start handling these creatures. Um, I want to look at some of the details of, this, of the characters that we need to look at, because if nothing else today, you can go, if we look at these, you can go and use the keys quite happily once you know the kind of things we're looking for. So the colour and size and shape are, as with a lot of animals, they, it does work there. They, they do help the, um, the diagnosis. The spots along the side might be different colours. Uh, and these spots along the side of a millipede 
um, are called ozodines and they produce noxious chemicals and um, some, some millipede you can pick up and they'll wriggle about and they'll produce these chemicals on your hand and they might stain your hand, um, they might smell of iodine and there's a whole range of different chemicals that they're producing um, which makes them very unpleasant to eat um, from, a, from a predator's perspective or from your perspective for that matter if that's the way in, inclined that you are. Um, so don't eat them, they don't taste good. I did taste it once, it's not good. Um, so I mentioned uh, another character, so you've got spots down the side and some of them pale, some of them dark, all sorts of colours. What we have in the column at the front, you can see that it's like a, a battering ram, um, like this bucket on, a, on a, uh, a digger, and that's for pushing its way through. Now whether that overlaps the head as it does in the top picture here, or whether it tucks into the back of the neck, that's a helpful character. Um, so as, as you look through the key later on, you'll see that that's something that you're looking for, whether it's completely engulfed the head or not. Um, and another thing you can see here, this is, you can see the, the column overlapping quite nicely over the head here. But what we're looking at on this one is, is this, these stripes along the lower half of this uh, individual. So this species, Boreoeulus tenuis, you can see these stripes, um, these grooves are only in the lower half, but over here with the, the, the actual stripes and snake millipede, you can see these, these grooves carry on right over the very top um, of the arch of the body. And so that's, that's quite a useful character when we come to looking at the snake millipedes too. Eyes, how many eyes have they got? Um, eyes are very useful. Um, they, they, the pattern of the eyes helps you uh, work out what the species is. And also the number of ocelli within an eye can help you to uh, calculate the age of a specimen. Um, and sometimes with some of the female species, uh, of, of species, it helps to know how old they are to identify them. So you can work out their age by the number of ocelli. So when we talk about eyes, yeah, it's got, um, they have um, eyes in a row. We mean the ocelli really. So I'll use the word eyes um, uh, interchangeably with ocelli. But you can see here, there are a row of perhaps four or five in a, in a straight line and a couple above. Or in here, there's a triangle of, of a, a whole host of perhaps 20 odd um, ocelli uh, and, and so it goes. So the number of eyes, the number of ocelli, we know they have two eyes and equally some species have no eyes, some, have, some are blind. So that's, that's a very useful character too. A really key thing to look for, if you pick up a millipede, you see you see any of us who know what we're doing with millipedes, we'll pick, we'll still, we think we know what it is, but we'll always have a look at its tail. We'll get our hand lens and we'll uh, take a look at its tail because there's a, that's a really easy character to see, whether it sticks out straight, whether it droops down a bit, whether it's club shaped, whether it's got nothing at all, whether it might even have one at the top and one at the bottom. Um, so the tail, the, 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 the I, I get slightly irritated when I, I see people go, oh, it's a black snake millipede, you know, because they know it because it's black with white legs. But actually, there are a couple of things that look like that, really. Um, so, you know, those of us who are reasonably experienced will pick up a black snake millipede just to check that its tail is just slightly turned up at the end. And that will tell us that it is indeed the black snake millipede. So great to check the tail. Some have little spinnerets. There are, this is how varied they are. They, they produce silk and have tiny little spinneret type structures at, at the back of the body. So that's uh, a, quite a distinct thing. Genitalia, as with most invertebrates, is really key. Um, you know, the species are based on whether they can reproduce. A species is something that can reproduce with another individual of the same type and produce viable offspring. If their genitalia don't match, they're not going to be able to breed. 
So the, the form and function of the genitalia is really critical. We often talk about genitalia in terms of um, uh, in millipedes and often what we're actually looking at are sort of secondary sexual characters which are part of the process perhaps it's something that they that the male or the female hangs on to or it's something that uh, is used for sperm transfer it may not actually be a penis particularly that you're looking at it but some kind of structure that takes the sperm and then transfers it on um, it's really helpful characters some of them you can see in the field with a hand lens and they are very distinctive and really uh, the bottom line for identification the they are as i mentioned at the beginning usually modified from a pair of limbs one way or another and so in in a male you may find that behind the sixth or seventh pair of legs you've got these structures that you can see circled there and because it's been formed from a pair of legs, there's a gap. So instead of a leg pair, you've got a gap and this little thing called a gonopod, uh, which means that when you look at a, a male, of a, a millipede, um, more often than not, the males will have a gap around the seventh pair of legs um, where these structures have been formed. So that tells you it's a male because you can see the gap. The females tend to have a gap um, around the second pair of legs um, and that's where her reproductive organs are. So again, because they don't match up, um, just if we can show that. So you can see in this uh, on the left hand side that arrow is pointing to a gap. There's a gap there and there are some gonopods that are formed for the transfer of sperm uh, So this is a male and this is a female of a different species but you see the gap uh, after the second pair of legs but if they were the same species you can imagine when they're mating the males are up here and the female if you can see my hands in the I don't know if you've got me on your screen but basically they're not lined head to head they're usually somewhat out of line and usually curled round so you've probably got the male is curved round protecting the female a bit but because of that discrepancy and where the uh, uh, sort of sexual organs are, um, you see that difference. Um, slightly different in some in pill millipedes and bristly millipedes, um, but in all millipedes, um, it's the, the 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 actual uh, the, the sexual organs are actually around the second pair of legs. But we won't go. I won't worry you with that at the moment. So this is uh, this is the underside of one of the flatback millipedes, and and you can see these beautiful amber golden structures, these gonopods, are quite clear to see. And, and if you extract it, as the picture on the right shows, isolated, it's quite a, quite a, a distinct um, structure, quite interesting things to look for and very helpful for identification. Um, again, this is a picture on the right, you can see this is a male, it's got a gap. Sometimes there are other secondary sexual characters, which like uh, in some of the flatbacks, the legs are bigger and more robust uh, in the males around that front part of the body. So that's quite helpful uh, to sex your millipede. Um, and also they have these um, different characters. Some males of the snake millipedes have, have things like this spatula-like structure in uh, Euless scandinavius. Um, and uh, other other species have completely different structures there, as as I'll try and show you, if I can hurry up because your time is running out. Um, again, we were going to ask you for a nice interactive moment here, but um, as it's as we're an hour in and I've got an hour and we're not there yet, um, I'll carry on until Leanna starts saying, "Please shut up, Paul. It's time for everyone to go now." Um, if you do need to leave, uh, feel free. I, I, I don't see you leaving the room, uh, so I'm not offended. If you need to go and find the score of the Merseyside Derby, that's fine too. Um, but I would like us to move on to where the key is and, and, and just a little bit of information on route to that, if I may. Um, so do start waving and shouting at me um, if you need me to shut up. Anyway. Um, 
they tend to they they reproduce as as we've seen as I mentioned they might make a little cell in the soil to um, uh, possibly with a silken uh, little case like that to uh, increase the number of uh, uh, body segments uh, as they grow and they'll add legs each time. So it's quite important to know if you've got a male or female for certain um, to identify these things but also you really want to be dealing with adults and um, the number of body segments that carry legs will give you some of that information about is this thing an adult? Am I dealing with an immature? In which case, maybe the key is not that is going to be a little bit confusing. Um, there's this proliferation zone at the back end of a millipede where there are perhaps no legs. Um, so there are segments, but there are no legs. And as they grow, they kind of start adding legs. And so eventually, when they're fully grown, they tend to be legs from start to finish. Um, and generally speaking, not always. Um, but uh, so you can see as they grow um, these things, it's very important if you've got an adult uh, to then be able to, um, yeah, work, well, work out if it's an adult. So I'll take a breath and a drink of water. This is the key. It's impossible to go through this in 15 minutes or even in minus one minute, which is actually, I believe, how long I've got. Um, the key, it's a dichotomous key and the end it will give you two options each time. There is a bit of interactivity on the CD. If you click on the two, it will take you to two. It will take you to the next thing, but that's about as interactive as it gets. I'm gonna whiz through the key just so that you're familiar with it and to pick out some of the common species and what the key characters are. I know it's impossible uh, in this time scale for you to get your head around this, but let's see what we can do. At least when you come back to watching the recorded version of this, you could slow me down. You can look at each page of the key and stop it and freeze it, even if you haven't bought the CD. So let's at least see every page. So is it a bristly millipede? They're really obvious. There's no other millipede like it. They look like little beetles, often under um, on churches are very good under the mortar of churches. They look like a beetle larva with a glowing back end. That back end, the bristles tend to catch the light. Very obvious, beautiful little creature, very, very tiny. Nothing else has tufts. So then can it roll into a ball or is it more like, is it rolling into some kind of spiral it are your options? Um, there are a number of different things that look like a millipede that roll into a ball. And then there are the things that uh, form these nice spirals. So let's look at the things that roll into a ball. It could be a woodlouse. The key difference, and this is, this is probably one of the more important things to learn, if nothing else. Um, woodlice have 14 legs. They've got seven pairs of legs. Um, they're single, one per segment. So that alone should tell you that it's um, not a millipede. It's got too few legs. If it's curled into a ball, the last segment here on a woodlouse is made up of five individual segments. So you've got five little segments there. If it's a millipede, it's one single plate at the back. Um, so all of that is one plate. All of this is one plate. Um, so if it's five at the back, it's a woodlouse. If it's uh, a single plate, and they're usually shinier and smoother, but that's not, not a really good character. Um, but pill millipedes. Um, Glomeris marginata is the most common. It's usually black with white margins, hence the name. It's got white margins, uh, uh, marginata. It's quite big, um, quite common in limestone areas. There are lots of, well, several others which I'm not going to talk about today, but Geoglomeris is a tiny little thing. It looks like a grain of sand and it lives in limestone and it looks like a grain of limestone. Um, it's almost colourless, really hard to find. Uh, good luck with that one. Uh, very tiny, two to three millimetres long, slightly smaller when curled into a ball, um, but a fabulous creature. There are some other fabulous things as well. I'd love to spend more time on these. Uh, Trachysphera, you're only going to see 
if you're in the Isle of Wight or South Wales, it's a very scarce thing. Adenomerous only if you're in Buckinghamshire or Ireland, I think. Um, so very scarce, but probably very, very underrecorded because Adenomerous in particular, they cover them, coat themselves in soil. So it's a thing that looks like a soil grain and covers itself in the soil that's around it. So very difficult thing to find. Very small, very rare, very, very well camouflaged. But we move on to more uh, snake-like things, one way or the other, or flat-backed things. Um, this is our cross-section again, so this will direct you as to which way we're going. Is it snake-like or flat-backed? Starting with things that are flat-backed, there are large things like this um, that has eyes. Um, and there are small things that have very tiny eyes. So again, we're looking, does it have eyes? Doesn't it have eyes? So we move on to the flat-backed millipedes with eyes and Nanagona polydesmoides, the super tram of the uh, millipede world. It's, this is the most common uh, around at this time of year. Probably now, if you go out, if nothing else, go and do the field work of this course is go out in whatever uh, city you find yourself or town and turn over, look in leaf litter, look under some logs and these things are probably there got eyes and these nice little paranota and some six um, hairs across the back of the body. Um, yeah, very common thing. More rounded, if it's got slightly more rounded uh, bulges at the side, so almost square uh, in cross section, but not flanges and wings sticking out at the side, may well be Craspedosoma rawlinsii. Eyes, shiny beast, beautiful coloured um, tawny coloured thing. Unless you live in South Wales, uh, in which case there are about another five that look like that suddenly. Uh, and when we did the course, this course in Chester a couple of years ago, we found another thing that looks like this just outside Chester Zoo, a species I'd never seen before um, called Anamastigona, uh, which was very lovely. So when you get to this point, uh, it becomes a bit tricky at the moment. Um, the very tiny white ones, sort of flat back, they've got these bulges at the side, more out of the side rather than on the back. Tiny little eyes, brachycutuma, under slabs in gardens is a very good place to find these, uh, under limestone boulders. Um, but I, yeah, I find this in gardens more, more often than not. Um, in the south, further south, I don't get this one uh, in, in Yorkshire, um, but if it's got really clear eyes, um, six well pigmented eyes, then that's Brachycutuma melanops. Um, Brachycutuma bradii bagnoli may be one species. Um, it's currently two, but they are very, very similar. Um, and the eyes are very hard to distinguish. And you need the genitalia of a male to identify properly. But you can see the column is tucked right into the back of the head um, if you follow the keys through in, uh, in blower. That will be how it's directing you to this family. So how am I doing on time? Ooh, not good, right. Um, the larger flatbacks, there are not too many of these, these bigger ones so they tend to be this sort of brown coloration. There's a mating pair on the right hand side, uh, quite shiny, lots of lovely um, sort of sculpture on the back, which can be helpful in identifying them. Um, but more often than not, the easiest way with these is to look for genitalia, and we'll, we'll look at that in a moment. Or there are some very tiny flat backs, um, which we will also look at in a second. So of the larger ones, there are, uh, there are the, they're all largely this brown colour, up to about 10 millimetres. They're probably um, uh, one of these Brachydesmus species. Um, you're looking to see that it's got its legs going all the way to the back of the body, so it's adult. And that you're counting whether it's got 20 segments in an adult or 19 segments. Obviously, you can find 19 segmented polydesmus species, which are not quite adult. Um, so this, is, this can be a bit tricky. But when you're more familiar with what they look like, um, polydesmus and brachydesmus are quite different. Um, Brachydesmus is a little bit, has, has got small spines 
along the back. You'll see that here. So it's got these little short hairs uh, on the back and it's got 19 segments uh, and it's quite pale and, and less, than a, less than a centimetre long. The bigger ones, um, or where are we? Yes. Okay, we'll go. We'll go with the key. Um, but but the, the larger polydesmus species are much more robust and darker and don't have the spines on the back and have 20 segments. So if they're really, really tiny, and I'm, again, I'm sorry I can't go into the details of this too much, but if you look at the picture at the bottom, they're either really small and have a rough, bumpy surface, as this one does here, or they're slightly bigger with a, a more ivory colour and a shiny back uh, to them. They're both very, very small, and that's what they look like in life. Again, probably in gardens. I find these in gardens a lot. I tend to, I tend to look uh, very hard in a garden until I've found these. So slightly shiny, um, three rows of hairs, whereas this is much bumpier, both virtually colourless. The key thing between these two, and this is a really helpful character, is Ophiodesmus albanenus curls into a ball. So if you find a tiny little millipede, white millipede, that's curled into a ball that then unravels and trots off, that will be Ophiodesmus. If it's not curled into a ball, obviously it could be an unraveled Ophiodesmus or Macrosternodesmus. Macrosternodesmus looks like a rootlet, a tiny, white, thin rootlet. Very, very small, um, quite a challenge, but um, some of my favourite millipedes. This is them with an electron micrograph. So you can see Macrosternodesmus, all these little rough bumps. Looks like it's got three spines on each side from above. Ophiodesmus, very smooth with these three rows of hairs. So actually in magnification, you know, under a microscope, they're, they're, they're really easy. Uh, but in the field, Ophiodesmus curls into a ball, which is very convenient. These are the big flat backs. Again, can't help you uh, today with the details of looking at the uh, which one's which, but they are the classic gap around the seventh pair of legs, gap around the second pair of legs to tell whether you've got a male or female. And if you've got a male with a gap around the second pair of legs, these are what the gonopods look like. So you've got this structure here sticking up or possibly this structure here, and they look approximately like those images there. So yeah, if you're looking at looking back at this, pause on that and you'll be able to uh, see this one's got a big wing sticking out at the side. This one's got a fork at the end there. Uh, these, um, this one has like a spade at the side here and a little spine on the other side. So that, yeah, and you can see these things with a hand lens. Females can be done, but are a bit trickier. All I'll say is that Polydesmus angustus has these flanges that are sticking down uh, by the front pair uh, and the second pair of legs. Uh, they look like plates that stick forward. Very easy to see from the side. Whoops. Um, so um, can't tell you more than that today. And quickly, rapidly going on. So smaller snake millipedes or um, with no eyes um, or slightly bigger ones with eyes. Eyes or no eyes. So we're looking at quite big, quite a big millipede here, Cylindra ulus vulnerarius. Um, this has no eyes. Um, this is sort of pale at one end and pale at the other end, coffee coloured, orangey spots, but it's blind. If you find a large snake millipede which is blind, which has a tiny little tail at the back, it's Cylindra ulus vulnerarius. I appreciate none of this is sticking in your heads, but Hopefully, as I say, you can watch it back at a slightly more leisurely pace. Um, some of the, the smaller ones that the snake millipedes that don't have eyes. So, so we've got no eyes and this is quite a big snake millipede. These are tiny little things with no eyes. And there are three to get your head round. And they're really quite straightforward once you get your head round it. So they've either got red spots down the side or orange spots down the side. And that will separate 
the red spotted Lana Eulis over here from the Boreo Eulis over here, which is orange spotted, fair enough. There's also Archiboreo Eulis pallidus, which has got all of the vowels, and they're orange, so a Boreo Eulis. So the difference here is you're looking at the hair, length of the hairs on the back. And it's not that difficult. If you get them up against the light with a hand lens in the field, you can see, you can barely see them. You really can't see them on them in Boreo Eulis. You can just see them on that electron micrograph along their tiny little hairs. But in Archiboreo Eulis, really long fringe of hairs. Blana Eulis, the previous one, it's something in between, but its spots are red. And if we go back there to summarize it, so you've got the color of the spots, either yellow or orange or blood red. So that's straightforward. What's the length of the hairs along the back? And then if it's a male, the gonopods are quite different. So again, se seventh pair of legs, there's a gap and you can see these gonopods. So easy, yes? No, maybe not, but and they are quite small. Um, but with experience, you can do those in the field. The other thing with Archibario Eulis, um, no, we won't worry about that, let's move on. So again, quickly, how are you? Maybe you'll be impatient, yes, okay. Um, now we are looking at the snake millipedes and whether the column overlaps the head or whether the column doesn't overlap the head. These are the smaller ones where the column is tucking into the back of the neck. And, whoa, well, I should not touch my mouse, should I? I keep doing that, apologies. Right. Um, very small, um, perhaps a centimetre or so, uh, well, eight millimetres in actual fact. And there are two Melagona species. No bulges, they are nicely cylindrical, they have eyes, and the column is tucked into the back of the head. These are quite um, pale and um, you know, slight amber colour to them, but not, not very uh, colourful. Um, that's a thing called Melagona scutellaris. Melagona gallica uh, is another species which is slightly more colourful, slightly more amber coloured, has probably more robust hairs at the back, um, but the eye, the, the segments of Scutellaris are 28 and there are 30 in Gallica. And the eyes, the number of eyes is different as well. Um, I won't go into too much detail about that, but there is another one as well, Voitai, um, that's, that's appeared on the scene since this was written. Um, so again, there may be other things. This, this area of the key, is one to be wary of because this is where a lot of the new things are keying out to. The Corduma proximum, Corduma sylvestri, you need a male, you need to look at the genitalia um, to be really sure which one you're getting. They, they have a nice equilateral triangle of eyes. Um, they're quite darkly colored. Uh, they trot along very rapidly and I don't know, I only ever find females, but um, there are males out there. But at this point in the key, there are a lot of things that will that are in South Wales and things like that. Um, the one I found at Chester Zoo, which key out here, which make life difficult if you're just relying on this key. Don't rely on this key for identifying everything, but as, as practice it, and an introduction, it works. For the bigger species, the obvious snake millipedes, what you might call classic millipedes, the sort that I've got in, in the pot there. Um, you know, these are, these are larger things. These are a couple of centimetres long, generally, perhaps a little bit smaller sometimes, sometimes a bit bigger. You're looking at the tail. Does it have a projecting tail? Does the tail not project? If the tail is distinctly clubbed, you've got two types that it might be. Um, and then we'll look at the pointy ones in a moment. So if it's got a club tail, the commonest millipede, the one you must not leave a woodland without finding, really, is Cylindroeulus punctatus. It's got, it looks like the thing on the left there. It's got dark, it's quite dark brown usually, quite dark ozodine spots along the side and a nicely clubbed tail. 
learn that one, you should know that one, you shouldn't leave a woodland without finding it under bark, in leaf litter, it's everywhere. Much more, uh, much scarcer thing in the south. I've seen this as I've seen this in Leicestershire, as, as far north as that. Much more parallel sided, lovely brassy rings to it, and a club tail. But it's a really big thing. It's up to like five centimeters long. This is a chunky, big old thing, Cylindroulus londinensis. And now for the things that have got pointy tails rather than club tails, and we are coming into land now, folks. Does the tail, the tip of the tail, the little clear tip of the tail turn upwards or does the tail tend to generally turn down or have a sort of concave underside to the tip? If uh, it turns upwards, there are two that we need to particularly deal with. One of them is very easy. It's got a little upturned tail. It's got two big orange stripes down the back of the body. Um, and really very few hairs on any of the body segments. So you might, it, it, it's, it's almost smooth of hair, um, but a few, a few hairs at the very tip of the tail. Omatoeula sabulosus, the orange striped snake millipede, is quite a big thing. There are two that have orange stripes, two species, which we'll look at in a minute. This smaller one, Brachiaeulus pusillus in the bottom left, um, doesn't have a tail protruding in any way. So oh, it's a, a very tiny projection and not much at all. Um, so it's got a projecting tail that's upturned, orange stripes and quite big. You can easily identify that. It likes sand, sand more than most things, but um, could be anywhere. And then the, the really common one, Tachypodoeulus niger, tachy niger to you and I, uh, black with white legs, but they're not always white legs and it's not always that black. Um, but if it's really black with really white legs, it's probably tachy niger. But do have a look at the tail and it's just turned up very slightly at the tip. And um, that's an easy one to recognize. Very active, very common uh, in most places. Um, one or two others that have pointy tails that where they're turning down slightly, that the tip is turned down or the whole tail is angled down. Um, we'll just look at Aleulus at the bottom. Um, not a particularly common millipede, but you may find you, you find it around. And then the whole tail turns down. It tends to be this lilac-y, pale coffee colour, um, quite lightly pigmented, um, but the tail is, is fairly distinctive. If it's got the turned down tail, there are a few things that could be here. Females we're not going to look at today at all. Um, but males, if there's a gap behind the seventh pair of legs and you've got a male, then there are some really useful characters. Ophiaeulus pilosus, if you look at this secondary sexual character just under its chin, it's an absolute hook. It's a sickle shaped hook. In Eulus, which looks exactly the same in all other respects, um, has got more of a down facing spatula at the front. Um, there is a difference if you look at them walking along. If you've got the two of these side by side, one of them you can see the legs protruding and the other one they tend to be more tucked under. Um, but it's not, it's not that reliable. You can't, unless you've got it absolutely bang on, um, but it is true. Um, so if you've got Ophiaeulus pilosus, there's this hook there uh, underneath its chin there in a the male and if it's Eulus scandinavius, it's got this paddle. That's, and if you find one of these and you're not sure and it's a male, you can see the gap. They're usually thinner, a lot thinner um, than the females in proportion to the body. So they're, they're fairly obvious. You hold it still and bend it back a little bit. They can tolerate that and you will see these. So you can do those in the field. Nearly there. Um, Leptoeulus belgicus, there are two Leptoeulus species, Cavillii and belgicus. Cavillii is very scarce and you're looking for features uh, around the front pairs of legs in males um, with both of them. But actually belgicus is a bit bigger and has a very much paler underside. If you look at it from the side, the, the lower half is very pale and it has usually quite a distinct pale line down the back. Um, and it is fairly hairy, but um, 
that's Leptoeulus belgicus, and that's cropping up all over the place now. So you might well find that one. That used to be quite scarce. It was considered scarce, but it's everywhere now. Um, so look for that. So this is the little um, striped one. So it's not as big as the large snake uh, striped snake millipede. But when you look at its tail, it has no tail at all. And it's quite small. I found these two, this picture here was photographed on the Wirral, uh, at the, on, um, right at the tip of the Wirral, um, if that's your patch. Um, so both in the same area, but this much smaller one, um, no tail, this one has a tail. Um, so good. Other snake millipedes without tails, there are a couple of species which are a little bit uh, tricky to look at. Where are we? Um, these two, Latostriatus, tends to be the one that's on a beach. Britannicus will be the one without a tail that's inland in woodland. This is very common in woodland, in deadwood. Um, but occasionally you'll get that astraitis away from the coast, but generally it's the thing you'll find in the sand dunes. And just going back one, the things I have in the pot here are Cylindrialis carulia cinctus. Has, a, has no club tail, don't be confused by the picture there. It looks like Londinensis, a little bit smaller. It's got lovely brassy rings around the body. It's very parallel sided. Um, it doesn't peter at either end. It's very similar width right across the length of the body. But it has no real um, tail to it. Whereas um, um, Londinensis has a club tail. So finally, finally, the last two. Um, these are very thin snake millipedes, dark coloured snake millipedes with eyes, and there are two, and they're distinctive if you have a look closely, the eyes on Proteroiolus fuscus, which is under bark everywhere, um, tend to be really, really acute triangles, so it's actually a line of acelli with a couple of other acelli above it, Nemosoma varicorni has a, an equilateral triangle of eyes, the acelia, a, 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 a triangle. So a lot more eyes. The other thing is, if you, when, you, when you're used to seeing them, um, one of them is much thinner than the other. Nemosoma actually means thread-like. And if you see the two side by side, Nemosoma is this really narrow, thin version of what is a, a, a fatter, more um, broad in terms of in relation to its length, Proteroiolus. So Proteroiolus is a bit fatter with a narrow row of eyes, um, but Nemosoma, very long and thin with quite a big patch of eyes. Um, and when you see the two together, it's quite clear, but um, you should find, it's another one, don't leave a woodland until you've found Proteroiolus fuscus. Um, because it's it really is common, um, but this narrow uh, row of eyes with a few more just below is how you tell the difference. So um, that's a lot. Um, I think I have, depending on what people want to do. I, I assume most people have died and gone off and uh, gone to eat something or whatever. I'm not sure how many of you are surviving out there. Um, if you, I'm prepared to hang around if anybody else wants it, and uh, I could show you some of the new rare species, some of these Welsh ones, but generally speaking, that's your lot in terms of the majority of the common ones. There are some pictures here that you can see that that's Polyzonium, only in Kent, but really obvious, and has this very pointy, sucky mouth part. There are one or two other really intriguing things like Stosatia, which again, quite rare, but very distinctive if you see it. And again, I'm just going through this. So when you look out, look back over this at your leisure, it, you can see these. Oxidus gracilis, it's in every heated greenhouse across the world. There, um, it's, it's quite a common thing in a heated greenhouse. Flat back, but these pale edges and very shiny, um, not really British at all. And then, and, and also in greenhouses, some of these tiny little um, hairy or bumpy very small, orange-coloured, beautiful, uh, some of my favourite tiny little millipedes. 
and also in heated greenhouses, Coniulus palmatus, which occasionally strays outdoors into botanical gardens and things, and only has a single row of eyes. Could look like Protoiulus fuscus, but only has one single row of ocelli, another fringing. And this thing is really scarce, only in uh, Essex, I think, and Kent, possibly, um, Sussex, sorry. And has lots of hairs on the back of its anal valves, but it's blind. So I find that it's very scarce. So hopefully as you go through the, you can see all of that stuff at your leisure. Okay, um, there aren't, and um, there's not too many pictures, but the, um, it just shows <clears throat> what you will see as you look at these pictures is that they all look very similar. And for a time, I mentioned that there's the, the, the flat back, uh, the really common one that's around at this time of year, which is Nanagona polydesmoides, which is very narrow at the back, and very narrow at the front, it's got big eyes, uh, well, lots of ocelli in each eye, and, and quite distinct paranota flat back um, flanges, if you like. And that, that was very obvious. And then there was also um, uh, one or two others, the, some of the Corduma species, which look a bit like that, but were quite scarce. And that was really all we had to contend with. Um, and uh, Craspedosoma rawlinsii, which was a slightly square one, um, which you know looked a bit like this thing in front of you, but was more orange dots. So there wasn't a lot of to concern us. And then, then people started finding some more. And it's not like these are that subtly different. They're really obviously not the things that the key is describing. So if you are using, um, if you're sort of using blower, this is, this is no longer available. Um, uh, but there is a new key, Paul Lee of the Meriapod group has, he's getting closer, but every time he gets closer to publishing a new key, somebody finds a few more, um, which is holding things up. But um, they, the new things look quite different and, and uh, will, will cause confusion, as they did. There's a guy called Christian Owen in South Wales who started to find things in South Wales, which he was saying, I can't key these out. And he was starting to share them with experts who were equally puzzled. And some of them were new to science, um, which is why they weren't keying out very well. So I'm just going to show you through some of these things. I say they look quite similar, but if you use, if you go onto the BMIG website and look at the bulletin, which is free to download, certainly past issues are, um, and I think I think they all are up to date. Actually, there's there's, there's we don't charge anybody. Um, if you want a hard copy, you have to pay. But but all the keys are in there. Well. The, the, the descriptions are in there. Anyway, when we last taught this course in Chester, just on the driveway, under a rock, as we finished the field work, I looked under a rock and I found this thing. And I thought, oh, it's a Corduma. I don't often see them. We don't get them in Sheffield. But one, when you looked at it, look at this, this leg. So you think, oh, is it a male? You see, you're looking male or female in case to help identify. Second, at seventh pair of legs, well, they're sticking up in the air. And that's consistent. You can see this great big bulging leg sticking out here, which is not like anything. And so from behind, this is a view. So that leg is, is forming these big um, wings, if you like. So I, I'd never seen this species before, but I kind of knew it was and a Mastigo and a Paul Keller, because I've looked at the key, but um, yeah, amazing. It looks just all in, in uh, intents and purposes, same as any of these other Corduma species, but it's got, it, it, it holds its legs out like that. And the genitalia are really distinctive as well. So if you find something like that, great, uh, happy days. Um, so then I found this in, uh, the botanical gardens in a heated greenhouse in, uh, the name escapes me, classic, the well-known um, botanical gardens near 
um, yeah, south of London. Um, I can't think what it's called, but anyway. Um, the purple womble. What more do you want? It's purple and it's got a pointy face and two eyes. Um, it actually has more ocelli than you can see there, um, but the pigment makes it look like it's just got two eyes at the front and a pointy nose. Um, so I, I'm not sure how, probably Steve Gregory, I'm not sure who coined the phrase womble, but it's, it's now called the purple womble, Rhinotus purpureus. Um, but if you've got heated greenhouses nearby, um, there's some fun things to find. Uh, and often they're, they're new to Britain, or at least new to, if, you, if you're familiar with millipedes of Britain, it gives you a bit of a, a thrill to find something different. Um, so this is, this is fairly distinctive creature. Uh, now we're in South Wales. So on the same day, under the same log, Christian Owen and I think Mark Telfer found two new species to Britain under the same log. Um, so that's, that's what I call um, motivation to look for things really. If you could start finding new things like that in that kind of quantity. Um, what happened was uh, with, as, as time went by, I think it's, uh, we've realized that quite a lot of uh, iron ore and various things were shipped into the, into the South Wales valleys and potentially brought things with them. And a number of these species are known from the Pyrenees, which is where some of the iron ore uh, for the steel uh, industry uh, comes from. So it could be that these things have just been shipped in. In the same way, if you, are, if you don't live near an area where they used to ship in iron ore, look in garden centres, because things are being shipped into garden centres all the time. So if you want to find some interesting uh, myriapods and woodlice, um, have a look in your local garden centre, turn over some pots, you know, ask permission or not, depending on your uh, frame of mind. But um, it's usually easy to find all sorts of things. But these things, the whole of South Wales is now, uh, have been, we've been searching all over the place for a whole host of things, um, the new things. This is a tiny little thing, the Bethai beast, uh, found in Coombe uh, Coal Tip uh, near Bethai in the Rolder Valley. And, uh, Cranagona dalensi, and if you can see, that's a piece of moss. So it's tiny, it's really, really small and quite distinctive, it's adult um, legs right to the back end here. Um, and this is a male. So really, you know, you've got all that you need to identify it, except you don't know where it's from, you know, which book to use when you start with these things. Um, but the key is, is out there now, or at least the, the description. Um, and then, so this is one of the first ones he found as well, which is Hylibenosoma non tronensis. It's got big, bold eyes, uh, really distinctive and lovely sort of patterns of amber and sort of brown, uh, reddish brown. Quite a lovely thing. Very long hairs along the back. Looks a bit like that Anthogona that we showed you at the beginning. Um, and so just, just, in that, just in that area, but not just in one place, you know, in several um, kilometer squares. So it's not localized into just one spot. So these things are really um, spreading. Um, this one as well, so quite has a bulge. Anthogona does the same. Um, around where the male gonopods are and its genitalia, um, it's quite big in this, this sort, of, sort of sixth, seventh, eighth, uh, segment area, which can look quite distinctive from above, where you see this sort of expansion of the body. Um, but again, yeah, I say it looks quite similar to the other. And in the same places, in the, in the same place, Ceratosphis confusa, again, big patch of eyes, lovely eyes on the thing, these golden, these tones of, of amber, but this time less um, striated across the body. And now more of a stripe down the back, more of a dark patch, and the sort of double, um, these double bulges down the side. And again, hairs, but not quite so long, um, but clearly different to anything. You know, as, as someone who's been looking at, how, at millipedes for years, I'd have seen that and gone, that's different. I don't know what that is. Looks a bit like Craspedosoma, but it's not. So this was the kind of thing that's been happening the last few years, very exciting. 
and you can see there several places um, in South Wales. So a cracking place to go looking for these species. And then uh, up in the Kriegerabber in uh, near to Bridgend, lovely spot, really nice place. This thing, Slenderaeulus pyrenaicus, really distinctive. The tail at the top, which we talked about looking at, looking to see what the tail was like. It's got a really long pointed tail at the top, but it's got one at the bottom as well. So it's very different. There's only one other British species, which is very scarce, which has a little scale uh, at the bottom of the tail. Um, so to see this thing, I, I've seen it in the Pyrenees actually. Um, but yeah, the very long tail at the top, but also a long protruding tail at the bottom. You see something like that, then you've got to question what on earth is it? And lo and behold, it was new to Britain. And this was the same, this was that log. So you've got Pyrenaeus on the log and under the same log, you've got Amatoaeulus moriletti. And then this is something I've seen in Portugal. This is, this is quite well known as a Portuguese species, but it's actually been transferred all around the world. Um, but this was the first time being found in Britain. This thing stops trains in Australia. Not suggesting it's that big, but um, you get a mass explosion of populations and these things uh, swarm into houses uh, and, are, and are a pest, um, but they also swarm across railway lines and um, have been known to, to stop these great long um, uh, trains across Australia. Um, but it, it occurs in South Wales now. And I've been to this site in Craig Arabah and um, they're not difficult to find. A really distinctive beast. It's got these per lovely purple pink legs. It's a very chunky, very big looking millipede, um, sort of parallel, doesn't, it tapers a little bit towards the tail. Um, and it's closely related to this striped snake millipede, Omtoeula sabulosus, but um, this is Moraletti, which um, a fantastic thing and it's very easy to find under moss. But this thing, I, this, is, this is just gorgeous. Um, I, was, I, I get sent these things to photograph, which is, which is a great privilege. I don't have to keep finding them, but I do get to see them all. And this is a lovely thing. So there were two new to science that were found. Um, this is quite small, um, I, I don't know, it's perhaps centimetre, perhaps 11, centim uh, 11 millimetres, something like that. It's got eyes, it's a lovely shiny uh, amber colour, um, ivory colour, but with really, really long hair. So you can see from behind here, these, these, these hairs that are sort of meeting up at the top there. And it's a delightful creature, it glides along beautifully. Um, quite big legs to it. And um, it's been identified as being in the genus of uh, Tiflocycrosoma, <laughs> which you can all practice saying afterwards. Um, but, it, but it's a new species. It doesn't match any of the existing descriptions. So that um, hasn't yet got a name. Um, Tiflocycrosoma, nice little beast in the, um, again, in Nimerdi in, in, in uh, South Wales. And, um, and then this little lad, which I've seen on, which has been mentioned on the television and was in, was it the Metro newspaper or something? I think possibly because somebody called it the Merdy Monster. And so it captured the imagination. Um, and again, it was new to science, but it was recognized as another of the Terdulisoma uh, species, one of which we saw earlier, um, but, but with significant uh, differences to, to that. So it's a new species uh, but this one has been described now and has been named after Helen Reed, who is the secretary of the British Meriopod uh, and Isopod group, um, who does a lot of uh, research on taxonomy. So this has been named after Helen. So it's now uh, Terduli Soma Helen Reedi, um, which is great. And it's a lovely, lovely beast, but it's, it's in several places, I think. Um, and this is a this is this is a Terdulisoma. This one was known and has been described. And this is Terdulisoma tergillorum. Um, and this one, sorry, apologies. This one wasn't described either. This is also a new. Oh, this is also a new species called Terdulisoma tergillorum. Um, so 
two new species of Tergiulisoma um, from the same area near Bridge End. Um, and then just, um, I'm not quite sure, it's probably nearly at the end now. So this was also sent to me in, in um, there's an old uh, garden centre, an old botanical gardens in Ventnor, Isle of Wight. Um, and this thing was found there first and has also subsequently been found near Plymouth. And if you, and as you'll see, this is another one where she's got a tail at the top and a tail at the bottom. Uh, it's a much chunkier thing. It's, it's got a number of other different characteristics and the males are quite distinct, um, the genitalia. But this is Cylindro Iulis apeninorum. Um, and yeah, so again, if you find something that's got tail at the top, tail at the bottom, um, it's something to look out for. And just to show that they're not all looking like exactly the same, and you might just recognize you've got something a bit different. This is, this is an entirely different order of millipede to Britain. This was found in, um, this has been found in the, uh, what's it, um, the name which escapes me, that place undercover in Cornwall, uh, <laughs> um, tropical houses. Yeah, you know, you know what I'm talking about. I can't remember that. The Eden Project, look, I've written it on the side. I'm just blinded by the pretty pictures in the Eden Project. Paraspirobolus lucifugis, brightly colored, big orangey red stripes down the side, big fat eyes, and it's a spirobolid, which is not, we don't get spirobolids in, in this country. They're, oh, they're tropical species. So it's only gonna be found in tropical houses. Um, and the, my favourite is this. This is this is from Rotherham, and it does also occur at Kew. And uh, Cylindro desmus hirsutus, um, hirsutus I mentioned earlier. It's just a really furry little thing. It's beautiful, and you, it either comes in this light white variety or this um, lovely golden uh, brown. And it, it's it's the most delightful thing. But it's it's very small. It's um, I don't know. It's only about five millimeters long. Um, but it's sort of thing you'll find in a, a, a hot house. And it just, it just brings me to one thing which I want to leave you with, um, which is, see the end of that name, Cylindro Desmus. Desmus, they're the flatbacks. So all of these complicated names that we've been talking about, Polydesmus, uh, and all, all, anything Desmus, they're the flatbacks. If it's, Iulus, like Cylindro Iulus, Omato Iulus, Lepto Iulus, they're all the snake like ones. So these names get a bit confusing for people. I appreciate that, you know, I've only thrown scientific names at you in most cases because they don't have common names. But all these Eulis, Eulid, Iulus, they're the snaky ones, generally speaking, and the Desmus ones other flat packs. So Ophiodesmus, um, Macrosternodesmus, so those tiny little uh, ones like this, Cylindrodesmus and Polydesmus. Flatbacks Desmus, Iulus, Snaky. So that's that should be a helpful thing. And again, use the um, Myriapod group or the Facebook group for further information and watch watch the species list grow over the years. Hopefully with your, your new discoveries, because you're all going to go find new species, aren't you? I'll stop now. Yeah, that, that, was, that was fantastic, Paul. You covered an, an incredible amount of, of ground there. I know much, much quicker than you would, you would like to. Um, but I think it's going to be, well, it'll be amazing resources of recording, I think, as much as, uh, as the listening, because there's so much to take in. People can really go back through and... Uh, also through some of the, the bits of your key and that hopefully some people will, um, will buy from the website and um, just really helpful to have that narration for, for, for parts of that as well. So, um, and it's just, yeah, obviously there's a lot, there's a lot happening. There's probably a lot still to be discovered in uh, nearby places where a lot of soil and things have been moved around. And as I think I was chatting it before the talk began, you know, there's, there's not, a, a you know a, a proliferation of recording going on in in the northwest as far as uh, I'm aware, 
So I think, you know, there's a lot of difference that you could make here, but probably in most parts of the country. I don't, I don't know how many active recorders there are of millipedes. And obviously, there's a very strong society, isn't there, Paul? Yes, there are quite a few people. And the, the thing that I failed to mention at all is, is I record tends to be obvious. A lot of people will be familiar with I record as a recording uh, tool. And I know that there are other local options, but the, the Myriapod group are very actively involved in verifying for I record. So you do get quite a quick response um, from sending in millipede, centipede, woodlouse records. Steve Gregory does a, a lot of the uh, centipedes and woodlice and uh, um, but the millipedes, I think, uh, Paul Lee. Um, but yeah, so if you use iRecord, do do record millipedes on there and you will get, um, you, you get verification quite quickly. It's not one of these where you have to wait a year. Oh, that's that's great. Should we go through? Should we have a look? See, if, go through questions. If if we if you're willing, Paul, yeah, to, yeah. To, to carry it's, on. People are still. It's, it's raining you know, now. <laughs> we've we've still got half as many people, even after you know, a couple of hours. So yeah, that's, I'll finish yeah. you all off. Well done. Well done, everyone. Well done. <laughs> no, it's impressed. Right. Um, I remember there was. I'm just trying to go back through the chat. Actually, now there was a couple of people saying they get millipedes in their in their bathrooms or in their baths at this at this time of year is that is it just because there's a lot of activity it is um none of the myriapods really want to be indoors centipedes a little bit more so in that they can chase there are there are things that they can feed on woodlice definitely don't want to be indoors that you find you, you do see woodlice um but they don't want to be here either Millipedes, there's no reason for a millipede really to be indoors. It's usually a mistake. What I, what the usual, I mean, you can narrow it down. There are, there are reasons you can't explain it uh, inevitably. More often than not, we find that whether a lot of any of these creep myriapods and isopods in a house, there might be a log pile near to a house, or there are gardens that grow right up to where your front door is, and they're just straying in. They don't want to be in there. They want to be somewhere that is not, um, not uh, dry. If they do get into your house, then obviously your bathroom is a place where they will survive. And some of the smaller ones um, might feed on sort of fungal hyphae and just fungi and molds and things. So there are things that they could potentially feed on. If you've got rotting things in your floorboards, fine. I'm sorry to hear that, but then you might, um, there might be something, but the, the thing with millipedes and centipedes, people often say, all oh, right, you know, they're all pests, aren't they? Like, no, centipedes are feeding on your pests, so they're good. Um, and millipedes aren't feeding on uh, good wood. They're not feeding on anything that isn't already on its way to decomposing. Um, I skipped by the bit earlier on where it says that um, you will occasionally get millipedes are seen as a pest um, certainly in, in drought years where the only moisture might be a potato tuber so you might find localized aggregations of of the little spotted snake millipedes or something in the tuber of, because that's where the moisture is and there's soft rotting vegetation so it's a great habitat and they can feed on it but they're not really a pest of growing healthy plants and they're not really a pest of, of good timber. Um, they're only looking for decaying vegetation. So not really any reason to find them in your bathroom unless you've got lots of potted plants and they're in the soil. Okay, um, not sure if this was a question, whether, the, the, whether they could have come up through the drain and through the plug hole with, with carrying on with the bathroom. How they got there, I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, they're not going to get past through water, particularly. I guess they might somehow, I mean, they will survive underwater for a little while. Um, so they could find themselves floating upwards somehow. But um, no, they're, they're likely to have walked, I would have thought. It, it's also possible with some of these things that birds drop things, but then they're not tending to feed on millipedes very often. Um, most pests, and you know, my inquiries, I've, I've worked as a museum curator for 25 years, I've answered most pest inquiries in houses. Most pests 
are coming down from birds' nests, one way or the other. Um, wood lice are walking under your door um, when it's damp and raining, and you know, to them, they're very basic motor responses. They will turn left if they've just turned right, and things like that. They're very basic. Millipedes will have similar basic responses to directing to humidity. So they'll have, they'll have to have had a, a gradient of damp, damp, damp um, to follow and then find themselves with nowhere to go and your bathroom may be the best place. I don't know beyond that. It's not like in Australia where you're getting floods of these things coming in over your doorstep and filling your house. They might okay, get out of South Wales soon. Um, I can't see any more questions in the chat. We're, we're down to a smaller number now. I don't, I don't mind if, if people want to unmute themselves and, oh, we've got, um, oh, Kath, you've got your hand up. Um, do, would you like to speak your question? Okay. Hi, Paul. Thanks for a great talk. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, is there any uh, potential evolutionary reason for the flat back millipedes to have a flat back? Because you'd think they'd get stuck upside down a lot. <laughs> No, I mean they are they are very specifically um, of of all the millipedes. They are the they are the ones that tend to live in leaf litter, um, and it, it's it's they are designed as a wedge. There are there is there are papers written on this that they they are specifically designed for pushing through layers of things, um, and. Um, Again, because of time, uh, there's a bit mentioned in the CD about this, but the, um, they've got this completely solid ring of, of, uh, of its body, that segment, but also these paranota help lock back and forth as well. So there's no flexion. The same thing happens in centipedes, the sort of surface running species don't want to be flexing all over the place. They want to run straight. And so they, so they have fewer segments and they're chunky and wider. And so this, the, the sort of stone centipedes run on the surface, don't flex. And it's the same with the flatbacks have, um, have the, these paranota kind of interlock a little bit. So when they're pushing, they're not buckling. And, that, and that, that's been specifically sort of determined that that's one of the things they do. They, the flatbacks are, are a bulldozer and they are, if you, they are wedged. They've got the big column and this big back end and these heavy pushing tools of these legs. Whereas some of the, um, you know, the, 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 the snake millipedes are a bit faster. And some, some, of the, um, some of those new species and some of these cordumas and the small ones shift like crazy i mean they're really quite fast so they're then they're, they're more edging towards the centipede side they're, they're, they're quite fast things um and then the equivalent of the soil centipedes the geophilus centipedes are probably those little spotted snake millipedes the blanaeulus the blind ones and they're very flexible and they they live in soil and um they're not, not as flexible as as the centipedes, but they're relatively flexible. But they're all they're all really more about pushing. But yeah, flatbacks. Yeah, good question. I, it's something I skipped over. But they they interlock to stop sideways flexion. That's really interesting. Thank you. Um, great, Richard. Would you like to um, yeah, speak? Yeah, I can speak. Yeah. I've been doing a bit of subterranean pitfall trapping, looking for obscure spiders. And nice. I've got these drain pipes sunk down in coastal shingle. Are there any tricks to increase the millipede catch? Because I've caught comparatively few. I was surprised. It, um, I've not used them much. I've, I've, I've made some subterranean. Subterranean traps I've found are quite good for millipedes. I've found a lot of flatbacks in subterranean in grassland. Um, on the, if, are you using just in shingle um, and on coast? Uh, and, and is it sand and shingle? Yeah, or? it's coastal shingle on Anglesey. Yeah, okay. Well, it's um, shingle. Okay. I mean, they're very, 
the thing is, if you're on the coast and you're in shingle, there's a species um, I've never seen, Thalassisobates um, littoralis, which is um, a, a very long, thin um, millipede, which I, I'm not at all familiar with. It's on the south coast and it's quite scarce. But it's partly scarce because it lives in coastal shingle. Um, so keep an eye out for that. I mean, presumably you're in the northwest, um, and I don't. I'm not sure what the records are. If I had time, I'd look in the book. But um, yeah, it's it's co coastal Anglesey, so I suppose we've got oh, a, yeah, yeah, a nice Anglesey. climate. I mean, it, it, it's possible. I mean, Anglesey. Yeah, I mean, I think anything can happen in Anglesey. Um, it's it's got that sort of you're along that. Lusitanian sort of Cornwall to Ayrshire kind of area. So um, who knows? It, certainly in, in, in coastal shingle, there aren't that many millipedes you're going to find. But okay. if you do find it, it will be that. And that's a real special thing to find. That would be a great thing to find. Um, I did try putting bits of small potato on string and bobbing it down the drain pipe to try and attract things in. But I was just right. wondering if you'd heard of anything more productive no, it's not, because it's not a centipedes are loads yeah but I'd say I, I've tried it around here just just to try the technique out and I I it was in grassland and I was possibly how deep was I I was about half a meter down um with my okay. um, my subterranean trap and I got quite a lot I was quite surprised it seemed really it seemed really good for um, flatbacks and and um, mo yeah, mostly flatbacks really. Uh, so it's a while since I did it. Yeah. It was about six years ago. But um, yeah. now on, on the coast, you are you are you're very limited um, to what you might get there. I think. Uh, yeah. But I would have thought it would pick them up if it's going to. But yeah. it probably needs to be right down to where it's no longer shingle, but is very much more yeah. sand and soil. Yeah. I, I am intending doing some on the Carboniferous Limestone to the sun near me. Yeah. I'm thinking of drilling some yeah. traps down. Yeah, I'm good. mainly yeah. looking for spiders, but I thought if there's a bycatch, it might be worth looking yeah. through them. No, it's a great technique because you do okay. stuff that nobody else yeah. would be picking up, which is grand. Look out for my harvestman. Okay. Look out for Paralegolothus medii, a harvestman, which I spent 12 years looking for until I found it last week. Tiny little thing, very nice. Might be in the pitfall. Oh yeah, that. No, that's on. That's on the orb. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Cheers. Oh, a question from Rod. Um, are the shingle communities sensitive to disturbance? Therefore, time would be required. Maybe more, more time. Is that what you're suggesting, Rod? Potentially, I mean, I, I'm not familiar with, I would say I don't, we don't have much shingle in, in Sheffield. Um, our, our coastline's limited. Um, but um, I, I've always found when doing coastal species that a bit like I was saying about fly tipping, you know, the, the fly tipped bits, the roughest, scruffiest, most synanthropic, disturbed areas of the coast will will give you more species of these groups. It's just whether they've been brought in or just because some of them do like more disturbance. Um, they, 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 they're very tolerant to disturbance or some of them, I'm sure it encourages uh, a lot of these myriapods. Um, but if it's a very natural shingle beach, you know, I think you're going to get what you're going to get there. I don't, I don't know about time on that it strikes me in my lack of literal experience um, that I'd have thought Shingle Beach has been messed with the same way for a long time and things that are there are what's going to be there. I don't know, maybe Richard knows better and maybe Richard has experience of different areas of spider hunting in different parts of the coast. Well, the, the traps have turned up new records for Anglesey of spiders, so I think potentially that might be quite interesting. Mm. I was just mainly surprised that there were so few millipedes in it when compared to centipedes, there were absolutely hundreds of them in there. Mm. So I, I don't know if you, you had any 
trips for subterranean trapping in general, really, because that's something I'd like to get into really, more. The only thing that strikes me, I mean, I, I know absolutely nothing about it really, but it does strike me that if you're a detritus feeder, it's a very specific detritus on the coast. You know, under shingle, it's very much very salty um, seaweed that is that's decomposing. Um, I would have thought that, that, that is, that's a very specific creature that's going to be able to tolerate that. It's as opposed to some that you, you get all sorts of variety going on in the splash zones and things where things can kind of tolerate a bit of salt but then run away or whatever. Um, I'd have thought within shingle it's got to be species that you know if you, you it's you're feeding on a very salty piece of kit really. I mean yeah, it's different vegetation to your average millipedes mouthful really. I think so. Yeah, I don't know not not my expertise in that area. Anybody would like to wave and give a proper answer, feel free. Anything about inland Yorkshire be even better. <laughs> Tell you about the moorlands, high moorland species. Richard? Yeah. yeah, I'd be interested in upland millipedes because I do a lot of surveys high up in Snowdonia looking for Arctic alpine spiders, but I, I don't recall ever seeing millipedes up high. Are there millipedes up there or are they yeah. more lowland? Um, no, there are some. There are some which are, are Euless Scandinavius, I think. I tend to see much more upland around here. It's not a vast difference. I mean, I, I, I'm not, mine are not mountains. Mine are not, mine's not Snowdonia. They're, they're, but they're, the difference between upland and lowland around here is obviously a lot less. But they, but they are... It's, it's more of an acid uh, alkaline difference and more than anything else I would, I'd have said um, and it's those which tend to be I would say that I find Euless Scandinavius up in heather and in coniferous woodland which is a much more acid environment rather than anything to do with the altitude so I think it's much more geological than geographical um, altitude effect that, that would be my view on that but I mean there, there, it has no it has no issue for them I mean polyxenus the bristly millipede is found at the top of mountains um, it's found on um, Chesil Beach um, it's found in the Sahara Desert so you know there, there could ease, it could be all sorts of things um, but I think it's more about the geology that's going to affect them I mean, there are, there are a bunch of these things which they're in the south for a reason. They prefer it warmer. So we're not going to get those scarce things that are in the south cropping up at the top of Snowdon. But um, so it's, it, yeah, it's a balance between all those things, I think. I know, um, there isn't a specific, I couldn't give you a specific package of millipedes that you'll find above, you know, 200 metres or anything. But um, I, I just tends to be that. It's, it's a geological acid alkaline thing to my mind. What's that really big centipede that you get really high up? Um, I'm really sure. that massive one. Is it's quite I thought it was quite a distinctive thing. Um Geophilus carpophagus, East no. and I, maybe it's not that, is it? No. Uh, Lithobius variegatus. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking of. You get, oh yeah, but you get that everywhere. Well, you yeah, get that right. everywhere west of the A1. You don't get it east of the A1. Um, <laughs> not really. I just, did. <laughs> yeah, well done. <laughs> Once. <laughs> yeah, it, it used to, it, the map used to be a beautiful map of the country with just variegators was just west. And it was pretty much straight down sort of the middle of Yorkshire. Um, but yeah, it just crop up. Uh, it's, it's madness, there's no reason why it shouldn't be further east there, but um, no, no, variegators is all over the place. Variegators is, is uh, like variegators is the, is the one that doesn't move, so you know, it thinks it's hidden, so it's a nice easy one to identify, apart from the stripes, it just, just doesn't tend to run away. If anyone, I mean, if talking centipedes, or we talked about handling things and catching things, the tip with centipedes is 
when they run away, they're much quicker, obviously, and you grab them by the back end and you're left with two legs in your hand. The secret is to keep those two legs because those that don't, don't then go after the beast and drop the legs. Keep those two legs and you might be able to identify your creature. That's my tip for the afternoon in centipedes. <laughs> yeah, if, they, if you think it got away, well, you might just about... You might just be able to do it from those. I'm not saying it'd be any easy, but uh, but that's a pretty critical character. So um, yeah, don't, don't pursue the, the whole thing if, and throw those away. Um, I can't see any more questions in in the chat or hands up or anything. Um, so any more for any more going once? No, you're only an hour over. Come on, <laughs> where's your staying power, people? <laughs> Steph, I do one more. Sorry, um, I've noticed that for a lot of descriptions, it says that churchyards are a really good place to look. And I was just wondering if you go into a churchyard, what would be your approach? What's the best spot in a churchyard? Uh, first thing I do in a churchyard um, is find the compost heap because that's where everything's gone. So it saves you a lot of searching. Um, I would probably, because I love bristly millipedes, I'd probably go and see if I can find some loose mortar or render on the church when there's no one looking um, and look for bristly millipedes. Um, but you tend to have lots of nice big bits of stone lying around in, in churchyards. Obviously, be selective as to the ones that have been <laughs> cast to the base of a wall rather than the ones that have that buried someone under. Um, <laughs> but usually, the, around the walls of, of a churchyard, there are often bricks and, and bits of old broken, um, just yeah, just bits of broken uh, tombstone or whatever. Um, and the base of the church itself. They're usually very wet. They usually got like gravel and channels of where water's run down. Um, so it's nice and moist there all the time. Even in the summer, it's usually usually damp at the base of a church wall. Um, so yeah, find the north side of the church, find the damp bits. But but I would head for the compost heap first, always. Cool. I peel bits off my local church. Nice. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. They're very good. They're very good. I'm not quite sure. Why? I suppose they've been there a long time and they haven't been changed much, but equally they get a lot of turnover and, and yeah, a lot of disturbance. But um, their churchyards are great. Great, thank you. Excellent. So is, is that it then, I think? <laughs> Going. Um, well, this is... <laughs> <laughs> this is... This has been really quite a, a, an epic um, <laughs> webinar and you're... The, Paul, the depth of your knowledge is is very impressive indeed, um, and uh, uh, I think I, I, think I just I read it from that, honey. <laughs> just full on that. I think we need a round of applause there. there we go. <laughs> Most people are on mute, but there we go. <laughs> um, but to yeah, to to everyone, thank you very much um, for for joining this afternoon, and uh, and I'm sure you, you won't have taken in everything that Paul said, um, but. You know, thankfully, it's gonna it's gonna be really helpful to to have a have a recording of this on on YouTube very soon. Um, and as Paul has said, please um, please do consider the the CDs. I mean, they they look like excellent slides that you were showing, Paul. And I'm sure um, you know that would really help you alongside. Is blower still available? That that, that key. It's out of print. You can occasionally pick it up um, from secondhand places. So not so much, um, but no. I, I mean, I was going to say the with the CD, the, the key to the wood lice is quite straightforward. That's a, that's like a chart, and then the centipede key on there is just the common things compared to one another and described. So there, there's a key for each of those things on there as well. So go to Nature Bureau and snap up the last of our stock. <laughs>